Okay, let's do this. Oh, shoot. Well, I guess we're going to the dark room. Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage, and if this is the first time you're stopping by, here's a playlist of all of our LFF episodes. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, there's gonna be something new in the world of large format photography. As you can see from the intro, my studio space is a total mess. So today, I'm heading into the darkroom here at 400 West Rich, and we're gonna talk setting up a large format darkroom. So one of the first questions you're gonna need to ask yourself when it comes to a darkroom is, do you need a darkroom space? It really depends on your involvement with the analog process. If you want to develop your own film, make contact sheets, enlarge your film, or dabble in alternative photographic process, you might see the benefit of having access to a darkroom space. But hold your horses, you don't have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money. You could also consider renting. Renting a space is typically going to set you back a lot less, especially if you're only printing one to two times a month. Now, a lot of us were really hyped and we're into it. It's a brand new process, new toys, and I just want to get going with it. And we might use the darkroom a lot at first, but talk to anybody that has had their own darkroom. They probably don't use it near as much as they used to. So you want to consider how long you're going to have access to it. I'm going to link down below to Ilford's site, uh, Darkroom Locator, where you can find anywhere in the world public darkroom and private darkroom spaces that you can have access to. If you're in Columbus, that also includes the Midwest Photo Darkroom. Now, I'm plugging that not just because I work at Midwest Photo, but because I designed that darkroom. And it's, it's one that is kind of based on the philosophies I'm going to outline here today. If you plan on using it more than once or twice a month, it makes sense to have access to a space 24-7 or one that's pretty close to yourself. It could be in your basement, an outbuilding, or maybe even just a closet for occasional use. So when it comes to a darkroom space, you just need space. I recommend bare minimum, you need about a four by six foot space. Now to some that sounds like a coffin, but the space I'm in here at 400 West Rich really isn't that much. I can actually span the width of my darkroom uh, with both hands. So this is about a six by 14 space and it's one of the largest darkrooms I've actually operated in regularly and it's fine. One of the first considerations when setting up a darkroom space or creating your own, like DIYing a space, is you're gonna to wanna to think about access to water. You don't 100% need to have running water or a sink, but that makes it really, really convenient. If you don't have access to plumbing for you know, space reasons or wherever it is, you can also go with bulk storage of water. So that's actually why we have the water machine here. If you're gonna be enlarging, obviously having access to an enlarger is great. And even if it's not an enlarger for large format like this one, this is a Bessler 23C, it's still really helpful if you're doing something like contact printing like we outlined um, a few episodes ago when I made a big contact sheet from 4x5. I still liked this because I had aperture control and I had access to my darkroom timers that gave me shutter speed control effectively over my exposure. And I can also drop filters in front of my enlarger. It makes things a lot easier. But again, this is another optional piece. One thing that isn't really an option though is light proofing. When you're setting up a darkroom, you're gonna want a way to keep the dark in, right? You're gonna wanna keep your darkroom dark. And I've seen a few different approaches to this in the past, and actually this space versus the rental space we have at Midwest Photo are completely different philosophies. This is a retrofitted space, and I think that's the biggest thing. If you're retrofitting something, so this is an old factory closet that was converted into a darkroom. And in doing such, there's a whole bunch of light leaks. I try not to do film developing here in the middle of the day because it looks like a starry night up top there. There's light leaks. And one way to mitigate those light leaks and try to manage the reflectance of the room is having black paint all over the walls. 
The upside of black paint is there's not as much reflectance, but the downside of it is for things like my safe lights or other accessory lights that I am introducing into the space, that black just eats light, so there's no extra reflectance in there. Now, let's compare that to a space like the one we have at Midwest Photo, where we have very controlled light proofing, and it was designed with enlarging specifically in mind. There, the walls are actually lighter. You can go with a white paint or yellow paint, and that's gonna give you high reflectance for things like your safe light. Now, the same size space as this one needs less safe lights because that is bouncing around everywhere. It's really good for black and white printing, but not as good for film developing. So I actually prefer to develop my film here at 400 because these black walls, even if I have a tiny little light leak coming from way, way up there, by the time it travels here, it's lost a lot of its intensity unless it's a very direct light leak. Now, as cool as revolving doors can be in a darkroom space, let's be honest, unless you just got one for free, those things can be really expensive. Upwards of three to four grand, brand new. That's a lot for a darkroom. If you're setting up a space, you probably just have, you know, a regular door. If that's the case, we're gonna wanna consider some light sealing. In this darkroom space, I just have a simple piece of industrial liner. So it's like the little rubber liner you would see in most commercial spaces, goes about three to four inches high, and we just have that stapled to the door frame. That gives us enough of a seal that really, really strong amounts of light are blocked out. But for a majority of light seals, if you don't even wanna do that, here's a reusable method that I also like. The photographer's secret, some good old gaffer's tape. Don't leave home without this. A $25 roll will light proof your area probably six to 10 times over, depending on how much you reuse it. Slap it around the door frame and it holds pretty well. In fact, yeah, I've still got a little bit extra here. Some additional things you can do. We painted the door jam here, that really helps. And we also have some foam, but as you can see, that's, uh, that gets kind of nasty over time. Changing heat and humidity really can take that out over the course of uh, your darkroom's life. So. Light proofing is another consideration, and this isn't just the paint job, it's also kind of sealing off those areas because light is gonna get through unless you interrupt that path multiple times. Another consideration for a darkroom space is gotta be storage. We just need space in our space to handle more stuff. You're not gonna have all of your darkroom toys out at once, and in fact, if you do, you're gonna have a mess like my studio in no time. So you want a place where you can store your chemicals, your graduates, and all the stuff that you may or may not be using. So, as an example, I've got this little storage space up here. This is actually an x-ray film dryer that we utilize for drying film and drying any other accessories, especially film processing reels. It keeps everything nice and toasty and dry. Below that, I've got another little repurposed metal cabinet, and this handles all of our bulk storage, extra graduates, extra trays, unused chemicals, and even raw chemicals. Wait a second, is this for a pick-me-up? No way, it's for caffeinol. Really, this darkroom space is nothing but storage. You're gonna to wanna to have a place to keep, you wanna keep things clean for when you start fresh. And since this is a space that I share with my darkroom roomie, Mr. Steven Takis, by the way, if you don't follow him on IG or know of his work, check it out. His Brownie in Motion project is awesome. It's big, ultra large format, direct positive, it's all the good stuff. If you like this channel, check out Steven's work. He's a great dude and I'm probably gonna have him on the show here pretty soon. Anyway, so storage. I've got storage underneath for chemicals. I've got storage up top for extra trays. We have these big cement mixing trays for doing ultra large format and other alternative process. You just need a lot of storage. And you don't just have to have a physical cabinet or anything. You can build up storage. So we have extra shelving space that's tapped into the walls. You, you wanna get creative with this space because if you just cram it all into a corner, you're gonna have a hard time finding it right when you need it. And sometimes you're gonna be completely in the dark when working with this. So you're gonna to wanna to have easy to access and kind of remember that storage. By the way, not all storage space needs to be fixed. You can also have modular storage. Me and Steven use this old AV cart, which is great for moving stuff in and out. Right now I've got a bunch of overflow chemicals uh, and empty cylinders, but we can use this to also accommodate processes that have multiple steps. I use this a lot when I'm doing black and white film reversals, so making black and white slides from black and white film. There's a lot more washing and intermediate steps than there are, say, develop, stop, fix for prints. So to accommodate that, I have extra trays out here for my daylight stuff, and I can free up the sink for all the stuff that I need to do in the dark. So consider that too. It doesn't have to be fixed in place to be good storage. Actually, let's talk about the sink a little bit. 
A darkroom sink, it's really nice when you have a dedicated darkroom sink like this old Calumet here, but it's not 100% necessary. You can get some of the little rubber slop sinks that folks use for arts and crafts or laundry rooms. Those will work great, but a custom stainless sink is great too. If you can, try not to purchase darkroom stuff brand new. A lot of times, if we're patient, just like a lot of things in the used world in large format, the waiting game always benefits us, the photographers. There's always somebody that's getting out of this. Really, for every one person that's getting into darkroom, there are probably five to 10 that are getting out of it and either have it in old storage, they're moving and they have to get rid of their darkroom stuff, or their significant other is like, you know what? It's time, it's gotta go. A lot of darkroom stuff, just a warning, is a take it or leave it sort of thing. So you can't just pick and choose. You wanna get this one cylinder, you gotta take the whole lot. So you'll probably find you have more darkroom stuff than you need in no time flat. Depending on the main purpose of your darkroom, whether it's for just a completely blackened out space for tray processing or enlarging color prints, you may have different requirements for a safe light in that darkroom. If you're using orthochromatic materials like black and white paper, we can get away with a stronger um, OC safe light, like an orange filtered safe light, that'll work really well. Or we can even take something like a normal LED light and drop a red or orange gel in front of it. That'll really help. If you have an RGB LED, so an RGBWW type LED, one that you can control the spectrum of light coming from it, that might be too bright on its own, but you can also place a filter in front of it to dampen it down. That can be used as a safe light. Or if you're doing something like using orthochromatic films and you want to develop that by inspection like Ilford Ortho Plus or FPP X-ray film, you can also use something like this Bright Lab Junior Safe Light. It is adorable. I think it's like a 10 watt red bulb. So it's really just a teeny bulb that has like a red paint on it, but that paint will take a long time to fleck off. And it's rated, this one's rated for what, 10,000 hours? Oh, 1,000 hours. So you're not gonna have this on for an entire year, so it's gonna last as long as you keep it in good shape. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to have in a darkroom space, aside from our space and our storage, things we're gonna to need to measure out our volumes, right? So if I have my developer and I'm diluting it one to nine, I need to be able to measure that out. This is a graduated cylinder. And these are some you know, graduated plastic beakers. These are great for measuring out large amounts of chemicals. If you only have one measuring tool, and we're dealing with really, really sensitive acid-base chemistry like developer, stop bath, and fixer, we might cross-contaminate. So even if I rinse this out the best out I can with water between mixes, I might forget every now and then. And the last thing I wanna do is ruin my developer and now I have blank pictures coming out. So having a dedicated graduate for your developer, your stop bath, your fixer, those really help. If you only have one, make sure you rinse it out very, very finely with water. When it comes to measuring out developers, I usually also have one of these guys. You can find one, a uh, little Pyrex shot glass. These are awesome for measuring out very, very small amounts. You're gonna wanna consider two main zones when setting up a darkroom, a wet zone and a dry zone. And they're pretty self-explanatory. The dry zone, it's where stuff doesn't get wet. And the wet zone, it's where things are not gonna stay dry for too long. Alongside your zones, you're also gonna wanna establish a flow to the darkroom. And my preferred method of flow is to operate in a counterclockwise manner. And that counterclockwise is going to go from my enlarger to my develop, stop, fix, wash, and it's gonna come back out the darkroom. So I enter the darkroom space, I move to the furthest corner, and that's usually where my enlarger is gonna be. This is so just in case there are any light leaks coming through my main entry point, I don't worry too much. That light will fall off and it's not gonna contaminate anything going on in my light sensitive dry area. So my dry area is at an opposite corner from my door or about as far as I can get from it. I expose, I do all of my light tight stuff over in the dry area and then I flow over to my wet area. And then I'll line up my trays, my develop, my stop, my fix, my final wash, and then it's gonna flow back out of the darkroom. If you're constantly shifting back and forth and back and forth in your darkroom, it's gonna be really tiring and you're gonna jumble over things, mix things up and potentially even contaminate the process. So consider setting up a dry zone and a wet zone for your darkroom. Some other things you'll wanna think about in setting up a darkroom space, a controllable light source, like an enlarger light source or just a light that you can turn on and off, something you can control. A flick of a switch makes it really nice and easy. Some trays and just like our graduates, having them labeled for specific processes really, really helps. 
If you do have a running water source, a temperature control valve, or at least a thermometer interrupting the line so you can measure the temperature coming through that line. And hot and cold access is way better than just dealing with whatever the temperature is. If you're running on a fixed water source uh, or one that has kind of a bad or low capacity heater, you can also get a little water kettle for heating up your water in the winter. Just don't use the kettle for like tea again, preferably. I try to be brand agnostic when possible, but this stuff, photo finish, it's the best. If you ever used a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, uh, this has a way more concentrated version of that in here, and this jar should last most darkroom lifetimes. It's good for scrubbing the stainless on a sink or just cleaning out a lot of graduates. If you're gonna be mixing up your own chemicals, having a little portable scale that measures in milligrams and grams really comes in handy. If you don't already have a copy of it, Steve Anschell's The Darkroom Cookbook is great if you're gonna consider doing that. Let's not forget about safety. Here in a darkroom space, it's really critical to have eye protection, ventilation protection, and some hand protection. And in the age of COVID, hopefully we all have some good access to PPE. So if you have some left over, definitely wanna have gloves on anytime you're handling something that isn't water. Even if it's topped off with a lot of water, better safe than sorry, have some gloves. And if you do have a place that doesn't have adequate ventilation, one of the most important parts of a darkroom, get a respirator so at least you're not breathing in as much of the nasty stuff. But if you're in a confined space, eventually that's gonna be coming in. So an N95 is a great way to prevent that. Eye protection. If you're working with really nasty stuff and you're just not sure, some cheap eye protection goes a long, long way. And to measure your temperatures, one of these little infrared thermometers does a great job. You just drop it on a source, it tells you your, your chem, ooh, stuff's gonna be warm if I do it today. Now, most of the chemicals that we work with in the black and white and even color darkroom are relatively safe. As long as we treat those chemicals with respect and we have an apron and gloves and glasses, we're not gonna have any big problems. But one thing that can also happen, is, especially if you have allergies or any sensitivities, is breathing in that stuff from open trays uh, is not really doing us a lot of good. So we wanna have adequate ventilation in our darkroom space. Preferably, you want something that can pull the air and change it around in your room about three times every five minutes. And a fan that does that is gonna be pretty decent sized, but anything will help. This is the fan I use in here, it's pretty loud. I can't have this on. Can't exactly have that on when I'm recording, so it really hurts my audio. But it also improves the temperature in here, and when I'm doing stuff with like a lot of fixer or tin type stuff or working with color chemicals, I can really tell the difference when it's off versus when it's on. If I can smell something nasty, I know that I need that fan on. Because if it smells nasty initially, chances are it's it's not gonna do us that much good over a long period of time. And I want you to stay safe in the dark room. The worst thing that can happen is you find out you have a sensitivity to something in the dark room because now you're coming into direct contact with it, either through your skin or breathing it in. Better safe than sorry. Use your safety equipment and have really good ventilation in that dark room space. So that's about it for my tips in getting started with a dark room space. Whether you're doing black and white, color, alt process, a lot of dark rooms are gonna be the same. You're gonna have a dry space, a wet space, places to mix up your chemicals, a lot of storage, some places where you can control light and temperature and ventilation. Those are all common themes when setting up a darkroom. But before we go, I wanted to update everybody on a process I debuted a couple weeks ago on the channel, and that's the RA4 reversal process. I've been chugging away at it, and the reason my studio was a mess for filming today is because I have really been plugging away at this process. I've been having a lot of fun with it, and I'm actually starting to get some pretty cool results. Here, check them out. So I got bored, this might've been like early last week, and I was like, you know what? I wanna do like a crazy one-to-one -one macro, so super mega close portrait. I took my 240 millimeter lens, extended it 480 millimeters, uh, eating up over two stops of light, but also giving me this crazy, uh-oh, creepy close-up portrait. And it's, even though it's a little bit underexposed, the color balance was getting a lot stronger. Did a few more. Uh, my Blix was going bad, so that's what gave me this kind of weird reddish cast on there. Oh, exposure got a little bit better there. What I wasn't accounting for was my filter factor and my bellows factor at the same time. When you're metering with lights, you always gotta add more light. Here's another one. I think these two dots might have come from a little bit of excess stop bath on my gloves when I was handling it, but here is where it gets a little bit better. This is one I just did last night. 
This is Strudel, my dachshund, and then there's Lauren in the background. My filter pack's getting pretty close. Now, in the studio, I don't have a blue backdrop. I have a gray backdrop, so it's still giving me a color cast, but man, the color accuracy on the main subject that's in focus looks pretty clean. And then I did a couple of portraits of Lauren head on, and the color is getting really, really, really close. Not 100%, there's still like some yellow and some greenish in there, but I'm really happy with how this looks. Oh, and there's like emo me. Kind of fun. So the next step is to gonna be refining even a little bit more and maybe even taking this into the ultra large format spectrum. Thanks again for stopping by today. If you have any questions, you can always feel free to shoot me an email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com, and we'll catch you next time for more Large Format Friday.